started a brand new series called Gifts of the Holy Spirit a few weeks ago. And um, I don't know about you, church, but I'm praying that God's going to do something amazing in our church over these next few weeks. He already began to do it over the last two weeks. We've seen God move in such a powerful way. I'm really excited. I love the Holy Spirit, but I also believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I think that there's a lot of people that are confused by it uh, or just have seen some abuse of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we tend to stay away from it. But we said that neglect is just the same as abuse. And uh, you can't neglect the gifts of the Spirit. I really think they're available to you and to me today. So we started a series called Gifts of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say that with me. Come on. Gifts of the Holy Spirit. And today I want to continue that. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, as you're going there, look at the person that you're next to and tell them, I'm so happy that you're sitting next to me this morning. Come on. Smile at the person you're sitting next to. Look at the person on the opposite side and tell them, man, you look like you lost some weight this week. Come on. That encourages anybody. <laughs> Everybody's smiling now. All right. The base, the base scripture for this series, uh, we read it a few weeks ago. I want to remind you of it really quick. It's John chapter 16, verse 7. This is Jesus talking to his disciples, I believe talking to us as well. Jesus said this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And so we have an advantage. We have the helper. It's the Holy Spirit. And he's with you and me. And it's better that he would be with us than even if Jesus physically would remain with us. Because he can be with all of us at the same time and empower us. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read some verses. Beginning in verse 1. This is Paul now talking about the Holy Spirit and the gifts to the church in Corinth. And I believe it applies to us as well today. He says, now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be what? uninformed. I don't want you to be misinformed. I don't want you to be confused about it. You know that when you were pagan, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God can say, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. In other words, if you're saved, if you're a believer, if you believe Jesus is Lord, it's because the Holy Spirit is already inside of you. Now, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. One spirit gives a bunch of gifts to all of us. Here are the gifts. In verse 7, now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. To one, there's given through the spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to another, still, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. I want you to highlight that. I want you to mark this passage in your Bible. We're talking about the gifts of the Spirit, and we got a, still a couple more weeks in this series, and I think it's going to help us understand who God is and what he wants to do through us. I'm excited about this series. We said at the beginning of this series, I really believe that Calvary, we're entering and we already entered times of refreshing. I believe that we're entering as a church into a new season. Come on, with fresh rain, revival times. Come on, I'm believing it for your family. I'm believing it for your home, for my home, for my life, for your life. Come on, we're entering new times in Jesus' name. Come on, from Kendall Campus, City Campus, West Campus that's coming. I'm believing we're entering into a fresh new season. So if you feel like you've been in the drought, you feel like your spiritual life has been in dry ground, I want to tell you there's fresh rain for you in Jesus' name. And we're praying for fresh wind and fresh fire. Anybody with me at 11 a.m.? Come on. Believe in that. This morning, I want to talk to you from this subject, power walking. Power walking. If you're taking notes, if you're leaning in, you got a pen in your hand, or whether you do it on your phone, I want to talk to you from this subject, power walking. We're going to talk about the gifts of power today, and uh, this series is a little bit different. I'm not doing too much preaching. I'm doing more teaching because I believe we need to learn as a church. Can I get an amen? 
Come on, let's pray. We'll talk about the Bible, talk about Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and then we'll worship God one more time. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for being with us, for loving us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that's available to us today. Have your way in this beautiful service, God. Thank you so much for being here. God, I pray that you'll begin to heal people already, God, as they're in their seats across our church from Kendall Campus to City Campus. Have your way, God. We thank you that you stopped the rain. The sun has come out. We pray that the rain will stop the rain rest of this week, God. We've had enough. In Jesus' name, all of God's people say. Amen. Oh, come on. All of God's people say. Amen. Come on, church. Can you make some noise for Jesus one more time? Come on. As I've been thinking about the gifts of the Spirit, I've been thinking that the kingdom of God and God himself is always moving and always advancing. With God, there's always movement. God is not a God that is still and doesn't move. He's a God that's always moving. Now, movement is extremely good for you, and it's good for me, right? Even when it comes to our physical body, movement is good. Anybody in here love exercise? Come on. Got a few people in this service that love exercise? <laughs> Any of you like working out at 5 a.m.? Come on, 5 a.m.ers? Any fi wow, a lot. Wow. Okay, those are all the weird people. Make sure you... <laughs> Just kidding. Physical, physical exercise is extremely good for us. In fact, I was talking to somebody who shared with me a report that they read that they said that they tested out people over the age of 60 and got them on a treadmill 30 minutes a day uh, over a period of six months. And in six months, their skin was rejuvenated. They had found some anti-aging properties in their, in their cells, in their skins, all from just walking 30 minutes a day. Come on, how good is physical exercise? Some of you are like, I'm gonna I'm walk right now. I'm gonna walk around this service. The body needs to be in motion. We need to be moving. Stagnant is not an option. In fact, to be stagnant, it, it can be dangerous and it can be unhealthy, and it can be frustrating to be stagnant. Anybody with me? The other day I was on a plane and we landed, and as soon as we landed, how many know what's the first thing everybody does as soon as the plane touches the ground? Everybody unbuckles, their seatbelt stands up. Every, you rush to get in the plane, and then you rush to get out of the plane. But as soon as we landed, the pilot came on, and he's like, sorry, flight 3819, um, the gate is full right now. We are going to have to wait uh, on the runway for another 15 minutes. 15 minutes on the runway, everybody at the same time. What was their reaction? Oh. <laughs> wow, that was great. <laughs> that was exactly it. Some people got mad, like, <sighs> like some people are like, oh, oh you, you okay? We're gonna pray for you today. And I was one of them, I was frustrated. Because nobody wants to be fr like stagnant, like that's frustrating, right? Have you ever been stagnant and not moving on the Palmetto Expressway on the way to work, come on. There's something about it, movement is necessary. As I thought about the gifts of the Spirit, I thought this is awesome. We have a God that is always moving, always advancing. He doesn't want you or me to be stagnant, to be at a standstill. We have a God who moves. His kingdom is advancing on earth, and you and I get to be, play a part in it. God's kingdom advancing on heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. Come on, everybody grateful that we have a God who moves. He moves. Come on, look at your neighbor and tell him he moves. He moves. He moves. We have a God who moves. This is powerful. Not only, not only is God always moving, he's a God who's always working as well. He's moving and he's working. Now, some of us may hear that and say, ah, I, don't, I object. I don't think so because in my life, I, I walked in here today. I'm frustrated. Look at where my marriage is at. I just went through a divorce. My kids are all over the place. My finances are a mess. How can you tell me God moves? Because I don't see him moving in my life. The thing is, just because things aren't going according to your schedule, your plans, it doesn't mean that God isn't moving. And so when they don't go according to what we want, I've been there, we question his power. And we question if he really moves. Like, God, I see you're blessing so-and-so. You're blessing my brother in church. He shouldn't even be blessed, but you're blessing him. <laughs> You've helped out this family. God, God, have you forgotten about me? And so we question his power because he's not moving on our schedule, on our time, or with our plans. But our plans, our schedule, and our ideas don't determine his power. Yeah. His power is not based on our schedule. 
His power is not based on our ideas. His power is based on his position and who he is. Come on, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of all the universe. He's the God that spun the world into motion. He's the God that just breathed out and stars formed. He's the God that holds you and holds me in the palm of his hands. Come on, he's the God that earth is his footstool. Come on, he rides on the winds of the universe. Come on, he's an all-powerful God. He's not just in the White House. He's not just some kind of government. Come on, he's on the throne of heaven, and he rules over all of the universe. Come on, God has power, and he's moving regardless of your situation. That's why the Bible says that you can sleep in peace because he's a God that's always working. The Bible says that the God of Israel never sleeps nor slumbers. Psalm chapter 4, I will lay me down to sleep and sleep in peace because you alone will make me dwell in safety. Oh, that means that while I'm snoring and while I'm having my fifth dream and I'm in the ninth heaven and I'm drooling all over my pillow, come on, God is in the universe working something out on my behalf. I don't know about you, but that makes me want to praise God. I don't know about you, but that makes me want to shout when I think my God is always moving. He's always working. While I sleep, he's active. Come on. He's an active God. He's always moving and he's always advancing. Here's the problem. A lot of us, we have a standstill faith because we think we have a standstill God. And so God is not really moving in my life. He's not really moving on my behalf. And so I'm, I'm good with just being saved. And then he's off at a distance and I don't know, God, you just, I'm good right here until I get to heaven because there's no way that you can move. Here. And I just believe that if you and I can believe that God moves, then you can receive what God has and you can be used by the God who moves. You can be used. I started thinking about the gifts of the Spirit a few months ago as we were preparing for this series. And I love it because it shows how active God is today. He's an active God. And I think sometimes we think that we have a God that's inactive, who's distant, who's motionless, or too detached from our circumstances. And so God is powerful. He's somewhere up there, but not powerful in my space, in my circle. But the gifts of the Spirit show us how active God is. The gifts of the Spirit show us that God is involved. He cares, and he wants to advance and move in our life, in our families, and in our spheres of influence. Paul is writing to a church in Corinth. And the church of Corinth was much like our church. It was a large church. It was thriving. They were doing amazing. They had an incredible growth track class and they had amazing people on dream team and the church was growing and expanding, going phenomenal. But when it came to the gifts of the spirit, they were confused. They understand and they understood that Jesus ascended into heaven. And when he ascended, the Holy Spirit descended. And when he descended, he came with power and gifts for all of us, but they were abusing the gifts of the spirit. And they had a misunderstanding when it came to the gifts of the Spirit. They had no idea exactly what prophecy was or what healing was. And so a lot of them were doing some weird stuff when it came to the gifts of the Spirit. Isn't that the same thing that's happening today? Yeah. Come on, some of us, we turn on the TV at night and we've seen some weird things and some weird preachers on TV doing some weird things with the gifts of the Spirit. And so what's happened is that we see this and so we tend to stay away from the gifts of the Spirit. And so we stay away from God's power thinking that it just brings a whole bunch of weirdness with it. But it doesn't have to be weird. Come on, it gives you power so that you can advance in your life, so that you can advance the kingdom of God here on earth, and so it can help you on your journey. And so Paul's like, hey, I, I want you to understand spiritual gifts. Now, there's a lot of spiritual gifts all throughout Scripture, but for this series, we've, we've been focusing on nine specific spiritual gifts because I think these nine are the ones that we have the most trouble with. Now, now, is it okay if I, if I just teach for a little bit? Is that cool? Yeah. Right. Th these are the nine spiritual gifts. You can write them down. We're going to put them up on the screen. These are the nine spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that Paul is addressing. Now, can we read them together? Come on. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, Healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, speaking in tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Paul gives the church nine different gifts that are available through the Holy Spirit for you and I today. In other words, when Jesus ascended and the Holy Spirit descends on us, he comes with these nine gifts. There's a lot more other gifts, but these nine are the ones that we've had the most trouble understanding. And he says, hey, these are, these are the gifts of the Spirit for the church, for you and I, not just for pastors. Not just for leaders, not just for the apostles, but for the church. You and I are part of that church. And so they're available to you and to me. Now, now, there's been a lot of trauma, a lot of abuse when it comes to these nine 
spiritual gifts. So let's get a better understanding of them. And last week, we began to break them down and get a better understanding. Today, we're going to continue, and next week, we'll wrap it up, these nine specific gifts. But last week, we said that we can break down these nine in three different groups, right? These are the three different groups that you can break down the spiritual gifts. Number one, it's revelation gifts. Somebody say revelation. revelation. There's three gifts that fall under this category. Now, this is one way to break down nine spiritual gifts. There's different ways that you can break it down. I found this one years ago, and it helped me. Revelation gifts are gifts that reveal something. In other words, the Holy Spirit comes and gives some of us revelation gifts so that it will help us. And we talked about wisdom, knowledge, and discerning of spirits. Now, the second group is power gifts. These are gifts that do something. Somebody say power. We've categorized them as power because they do something here on earth. They're powerful. We'll talk about those in just a moment. The last one is speaking gifts. These are gifts that say something. We'll talk about those next week, which is tongues, prophecy, and interpretation of tongues. And there's been a lot of confusion about that, and I can't wait to talk about it next week. Today, I, I want to talk about power gifts. We're going to talk about power gifts for the next few minutes, and then we'll worship Jesus together. And I believe that God... He wants to move in power today, and I believe he's going to come and, and help some of us here today. And so the power gifts. What are the three gifts out of those nine that fall under power gifts? Well, the three gifts that fall under power gifts would be healing, miracles, and faith. Can we say that together? Come on. Healing, miracles, and faith. Out of those nine gifts, there's three that fall under this category, which are called power gifts. When Jesus says, oh, wait for the Holy Spirit to fall on you, and when he falls on you, you will receive Power, the word there is the word dunamis in the Greek, which literally is where we get our word dynamite. <laughs> in other words, the Holy Spirit is not weak. He's not soft. He's not just an addition to our life that's there if we want to. Come on, he comes with dynamite power so that we can have victory in our Christian life to advance the kingdom of God, to live victorious. Come on, to move forward the plans and purposes for your life. Come on, tell somebody I got dynamite power. Come on. I got dynamite power. <laughs> Come on, tell somebody, I got dynamite power. Like, you believe it. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit is powerful, right? And he comes with a whole bunch of gifts. And some of the gifts that he gives to some of us are power gifts, gifts that do something. What I've come to realize in my Christian life and in my Christian journey is that a lot of believers, we believe that God can save us, but not that God can use us. And so we have faith for salvation, but we don't have faith for God to use us. Oh, I believe God can forgive me of my sins, and I believe he can get me into heaven, but I don't believe that God can do something powerful in my life or powerful through me. And so what I'm trying to get the church to understand, what I want me and you to have a conversation about is that the Holy Spirit is powerful, and he comes inside of me. He comes inside of you. He fills us, but not only is he in, he wants to break out. Come on, somebody. He wants to use you to advance the kingdom of God. And so he comes with these three gifts basically to show off the kingdom of God. Not for your glory, but for his glory. Amen. Right? The kingdom of God is here. The Bible says that Jesus said, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. The kingdom of God is advancing forward. People are getting saved, delivered, healed. That's the kingdom of God. These gifts show off the kingdom of God in a visible form. Powerful, powerful way. Let's talk about it, because maybe there's some confusion about them, right? What's healing? What are the gifts of healing? Let's break it down. What are the gifts of healing? Well, I would describe the gifts of healing this way. The gift of healing is the miraculous ability to use God's healing power to re restore a person who's sick, injured, or suffering. In other words, when the Holy Spirit falls on the church, falls on your life, fills you, to some of us, he's going to give the gifts of healing. That means that you are able to pray for somebody, pray over someone who is not well physically, mentally, emotionally, and God is so good that he'll use you to heal somebody. Anybody believe that? And so I think what's happened is that a lot of us think, wow, that, 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 that's great, but that's for pastors. That's only for bishops. <laughs> that's only for people that went to Bible college. The Bible says that the disciples were untrained, ordinary men. In other words, they didn't even have an education. Some of them were fishermen. Smelled like bait and tackle. <laughs> and God used them to do extraordinary miracles because we have an extraordinary God. That means that 
that if you have the gifts of healing and if the Holy Spirit desires to give you that gift, he can use you to help someone. We, we've had a problem with this because we, we think, well, God doesn't heal anybody. God used to heal people. But my Bible says that God never changes, that he remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. His power hasn't decreased. He has not gone back and sat back. Come on, he's the same God that healed yesterday. And if he healed yesterday, he'll heal today. And if he heals today, he'll heal tomorrow. My God is powerful. He can move. He will move just as like he did in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and in our life today. He's a God who heals. Now, the question is, will everybody get healed? That's not up to us. That's up to God. I do believe that sickness is not from God. I believe that disease is not from God. In fact, the psalmist, David, as he's writing Psalm 103, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. The one who forgives us of all of our iniquities and heals us of all of our diseases. In the book of Exodus, he told the people of God, I'm the God who heals you of all of your diseases. He's a God who heals. I believe healing is available, and God does want to heal. Sometimes he'll allow some people to go through some things for whatever reason. It's not from him, but he'll allow it, and you'll get healed on the other side of eternity. But he's God either way. Now, where can we see this example in Scripture? Here's some biblical examples of where we see the gifts of healing. You can write some of these down. Peter and John... In Acts chapter 3, the Bible says that they're walking into the city and there's this gate called Beautiful and there's a lame man there that's been paralyzed for years and he's asking for silver or gold and they say, silver or gold I do not have, but in the name of Jesus, get up and walk and he's healed at that moment. Healing, the gifts of healing, right? Paul and Barnabas in Acts 14, there's another man there that as well has been lame his whole life and they pray for him and God heals him in that very moment, gifts of healing. Paul The Bible says that he heals Publius' father. If you're having a child, that's a great name right there, Publius. Paul Paul heals his father from a fever. Sometimes we think that what we have is just so small, God is not even interested. Can I tell you, God is interested in every little detail. He'll even heal a fever in Acts chapter 28. In Acts chapter 5, we see something powerful happening, and that's many are being healed and delivered. I believe God heals physically. God heals emotionally. And God can heal mentally. Maybe you walked in here today and you're sick. Can I tell you, I I really believe that God's will is to heal you. And we're going to pray. And I really believe that the gifts of the Spirit are in operation here in our church. And that's why we're going through this. And and we're going to see some people being healed in Jesus' name. I'll never forget, there's a, a guy in our church who came up to me years ago. Probably now getting close to almost four years. And the doctor had told him that he had stage four brain cancer. And he had less than a year to live and uh, just came up to me and some of the pastors and asked us to pray for him. And it was really like, uh, I don't know what else to do. You know, it could literally be months until I pass away. And it it was a hard situation. And I remember, I'll never forget, I think it was right here. We all laid hands on him and grabbed some anointing oil, laid hands on him and prayed over him. And can I tell you today, he's on Dream Team, cancer free, years later. Come on. There's no more cancer. Come on, we have a God who heals. Anybody believe that with me? Come on, he's a powerful God. And, I, I, you know, I, I can keep going on and on and on. I've seen God heal people. I've seen it. This is not a story. This is not a fairy tale. This is not somebody DM me with some story. Amazing praise God. No, I've seen it with, like, my own eyes, right? Somebody else in our church just came a few months ago. They're actually... They live way up north, and they were just visiting somebody that we love and care deeply about. And her husband had stage four pancreatic cancer, and same thing, months to live. And during a worship night, uh, we all gathered around him, and we prayed for him, laid hands on him, and prayed for him with oil. And we got a text about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and she said, just at the doctor's office, my husband is cancer-free. I just, I just believe in a God who heals. Like, we're just going to step out in faith and believe that our God is powerful. Our God moves. Our God works. Like, it is real. It's happened. Somebody just came up to me after last service and said, hey, remember you guys prayed for my daughter? She is absolutely healed. Like, we have a God who heals. I wonder sometimes if we have the faith to receive it, believe it, that God wants to move in and through our life. The second gift that Paul talks about, gifts that are powerful and do something is the gift of miracles. Somebody say miracles. 
Now, the gift of miracles, I would actually define it this way. It's the ability by the Holy Spirit to do powerful and miraculous things, such as perform signs and wonders that give authenticity to God's word and the gospel message. Miracles literally is something supernatural. It's something that's impossible that God makes possible. I believe that we have a God that still does miracles. All right? Miracles are powerful. They're, there's no human explanation for it. It's supernatural. Our God defies the natural and does something supernatural in our midst. This is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is that some people will be able to do miracles. Now, where do we see this in Scripture? Where do we see the gifts of miracles in Scripture? These are some biblical examples on where we see the gifts of miracles. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4 that they were all gathered in a room praying and and all of a sudden, the room began to shake. The Holy Spirit began to pour out over all of them, and they all began to preach the gospel boldly. This is not Acts chapter 2, the initial pouring. This is another time. Just gathering together, the whole room shakes. They get full of the Holy Spirit. They begin to preach boldly. That's a miracle. right? It wasn't just a natural thing that happened. It was a miracle that the Spirit of God came in a powerful move. The Bible says that Peter was in jail in Acts chapter 5, and in the middle of the night, an angel appeared and opened up the door and set him free. Like, that's a miracle. There's no explanation for that. It's something supernatural. It defies our human laws. It's an angel appearing and setting uh, Peter free. Like, like I, I don't know about you, but I don't read this, and I'm like, well, that's a cute story. God, you're a cute God. Well, I love when you did that. It's like, I believe that that God can still do it today. Like, he can still do something supernatural. Come on, he's a God that he can open prison doors. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are in prison. They're, they're bound with, with shackles on their wrists and on their feet. And the Bible says that they began to sing praises. Like, they're just sitting there in prison. And they began to sing praises. First of all, that's already the gift of faith, which is the next one. Because how can you have faith like that in the middle of a situation like that? And so they're sitting there in prison, and they begin to sing praises. Oh, praise the name of the Lord my God. I'm leading the next service. <laughs> and all of a sudden, an earthquake happened, and every single shackle broke off of their wrist, broke off of their feet, not just to them, but to every single prisoner. Because when you worship God, something supernatural happens. A miracle can take place, and that's that every chain has to be broken. Every bondage has to be broken. Oh, the only one that can do that is my God, because he's a supernatural God, and he still does miracles today. And if you're wrapped up and bound, you can lift up your voice and praise, and he will set you free. That's a miracle. Come on, somebody. The Bible says that the guard wanted to kill himself thinking that everybody was going to break free. And they told him, hey, don't kill yourself. We're all here. We're not going anywhere. And they preached the gospel to him and he got saved. And then they went to his house and his whole household got saved. That's a miracle. Come on, somebody. And I've seen it happen. I've seen people bound up in witchcraft and in addictions. And in a moment, God set them free. That's a miracle. He still does miracles. Can I get an amen? In Acts chapter 19, it says that some of the clothes on the disciples healed people. Right? They would just pass by, and sometimes their shadows would heal people. That's a miracle. That's only through the Holy Spirit. It's, it's not man's job. It's the Holy Spirit's job to do whatever he wants, however he wants. But he'll do it. Paul one time was preaching in Acts chapter 20, and he went so long that this young guy fell off a window, fell asleep. Like, Paul, that's a great preaching. <laughs> just knocked out fell off a third story window and, and, and just fell dead on the floor. And so Paul runs down and the Bible says that he resurrects him from the dead. Like that's a miracle, right? I've witnessed miracles in my life. I'll never forget we were at a church service one time where this man got wheeled in with gangrene in his legs and couldn't walk, had all kind of sicknesses and disease you could imagine. And I'll never forget when the church laid hands on him and began to pray over him. And with my own eyes, this isn't that somebody told me. This is something I witnessed. I saw him get up from that wheelchair and begin to walk. And he hadn't been able to walk for over a year. And the doctors told him that all those sicknesses that he had were going to catch up to him. And he was going to end up passing away. And uh, God turned, completely healed him. And God actually turned him into one of the greatest evangelists that I can remember. And he started preaching the gospel all over the city and to different countries. I've seen it. That's a miracle. Come on. Our God heals and our God does miracles. Can I get an amen? If we got the keys come up, we're about to close. The last one is faith. Look at the gift of faith. 
This is the third one, is power gift. And the gift of faith is being able to trust God and to encourage others to trust God no matter the circumstances. It's the supernatural ability to believe God for something even if it seems impossible. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit, he gives gifts to different people. One of those gifts is the gift of faith. In other words, like we may be up against an impossible situation, but somebody with the gift of faith will stand up and say, hey, let's believe God. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask, think, or imagine. It may seem like an an impossible situation in front of you. It may seem like there's an obstacle in the way, but somebody with the gift of faith, they're just going to believe. Like there's just something about them. I don't know about you, but I want the gift of faith more in my life. I want people around me with the gift of faith. It's a beautiful thing. Paul says, desire all of the gifts. In other words, ask the Holy Spirit to give you all nine, all 22 that are in Scripture. Ask the Holy Spirit for the gifts, and he'll give them to you. I'm asking for this one. I need more of this one in my life. I need more faith. Anybody with me? When it looks like there's no way out, when it looks like life is just tough, and God, what are you going to do in my marriage? What are you going to do in my finances? What are you going to do in my life? God, we, we need a miracle. In fact, for for healing and for miracles, you need faith first, the gift of faith. Now, I'm just praying that God would fill people in our church with the gift of faith, that you'll believe that God can use you and will use you to move forward the kingdom of God in our city, in your workplace, in your family. Look at biblical examples about the gift of faith. Here are some places where we see it. All of Hebrews 11, like every single one, it's called the hall of faith. All of those men and women of God, they had incredible faith to believe God. They were up against impossible odds, and God just stirred up the gift of faith inside of them. The Bible says that Stephen in Acts chapter 6, he was full of faith and power to perform miracles. Right before they threw rocks at him and killed him, he had faith. In the, in the face of persecution, he had faith. I want faith like that. Peter had faith to heal the lame man in Acts 3. The apostles and disciples had faith in the face of opposition. They were being thrown out, killed, destroyed. And the church of God still moved forward because they had faith. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, Oh, that we would have faith that would move mountains. Come on, maybe, maybe there's a mountain in your life today. Maybe there's an impossible situation right in front of you. Maybe you came in today and you're saying, Alex, I'm up against impossible odds. I want to tell you that there's power for God to move in and through your life. And that mountain can move, the Bible says, if you have faith like a mustard seed. And so what are you up against today? These gifts, I thank God for them because I've seen them. I believe that the Holy Spirit is here. I believe that he wants to use you and me to move the kingdom of God forward. And they're available to us, and they come to help us in so many ways. I've wrapped it up in three different ways, and we'll finish with this. Three different ways that these gifts come to help you and me. Number one, they come to help the hurting. Are you hurting today? Physically, emotionally, mentally? Do you feel bound? Maybe you're here and you're saying, Alex, I'm sick in my body. I I got this disease. I I got this condition, and I feel like I've been dealing with it for a long time. In fact, it's become your identity. That's how much... You are holding on to this disease. Can I tell you, there's help for the hurting in Jesus' name through the gift of healing. I really believe that. So today, if you're struggling, I believe he can set you free. Today, if you're, if you're sick in your body, I believe God wants to heal you. It's God's will to heal you. I really believe that. Whether it's on this side or the other side, we're just going to be praying for, the, like, pray for it. We're just going to be faithful to pray over you. The rest is up to God. But I believe that God is a healing God. Are you hurting? I've been there. Maybe it's not a physical condition. Maybe it's a mental or emotional. I've seen God deliver people in a moment. In a moment, he set people free. This is what I'm believing for our church today. A lot of people are going to be set free in Jesus' name. I'm really believing that with all my heart. There's help for the hurting. Number two, there's possibilities for the impossible. Because of these gifts that do something, because of these power gifts, oh, impossibilities now turn into possibilities. Maybe today you're up against an impossibility. Alex, 
there's no way my marriage is going to be fixed. Can I tell you, for God, all things are possible. Maybe you're saying, Alex, there's no way that I can, I can find some freedom. For God, all things are possible. I read the story about an evangelist in 1986 within South Africa during the, one of the worst droughts ever at a huge crusade, over 60,000 people. He began to pray for rain, and rain began to break out all over the place where they were at. Can I tell you, we have a God who does miracles. And just because we don't have faith to receive them doesn't mean that God has power to do them. He's powerful. I remember one time I got invited to, to share the gospel at this event. It was full of young people years ago, and, and I went, and at the end, I, they gave me the microphone. I went up there, and I just shared the gospel. I just shared how Jesus loves us and how he died for us. And, and at the end, I just felt something in my heart. And again, a lot of these gifts overlap, and they work together. And so it was a little bit of like word of knowledge, prophecy, and, and miracle. I just felt in my heart somebody in there. It was a small group of people. It was probably about 100 people. But I just felt like somebody in there was dealing with with suicide and I felt like somebody was getting ready to end their life and sometimes you don't even know like to step out and say it because this might be weird and and if nobody responds then oh god help me like this is gonna be tough but I but I just I just said I said somebody here you're dealing with emotional emotional damage and I don't know what's happened in your past but it's leading you to live bound and you're tired of it and you're about to call it quits and you're about to throw in the towel and if that's you I would love to pray for you and I never forget a young guy toward the back lifted up his hand and he says, that was me. I was getting ready to end my life over these next couple of days. We gathered around him and we prayed for him. And I really believe that he found freedom that day. I believe that that's a miracle. That can't be explained naturally. That's just a miracle. And so impossibilities can turn to possibilities. Can I get an amen? amen? Last but not least, through the gifts that do something, obstacles turn into opportunities. Maybe there's an obstacle in your life today. Like maybe there's something in your path that you say, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen here. Can I tell you, he wants to give you faith. He wants to surround you with people with faith. And God will turn those obstacles and turn them into opportunities.